share our joys with one another. The Verdorns who recorded our greeting this morning have shared with us an update on their family. Let's take a listen. Hey everybody, we wanted to send you a video to let you know that we're all doing okay. We miss all of you at the church, right? right? But hopefully we'll see you soon. Aiden has started school. Yeah. Yeah, what are you doing in school? Uh, I'm learn 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 about chapter books. Chapter books, right? Lots of math and and science. Science stuff, right? You get to go outside and listen for for different things. Literacy. Yeah. Yep, all those fun things. So we're just staying hunkered down. Jay's busy with his work, building yep. lots of stuff. Yep. Uh, we're doing good, and yep. uh, hope to see you all soon. Thanks. Thank you, Verdorns. Good to hear from you all. And Valerie, I love your hair. Additional joys include uh, birthday blessings to Shirley Johnson on her 90th birthday this last week. And a joy for uh, baby Logan I asked you to pray for um, last week is out of intensive care following his birth last Sunday. So that is good news. Baby Logan is a, a 
child of a friend of mine. Those are our joys. Let us continue in prayer. Holy God, we give you thanks for your presence among us, for the way that you bind us together with your unending love. Be with us in this time of worship. Still our rushing minds and open our hearts to your Holy Spirit. Amen. Have you ever been invited to a party? Regardless of what the party is about, there's usually fun things to do, games to play. If it's a birthday party, there's a birthday cake. Sometimes there's balloons. I love parties. Do you? Today's story in the scripture is about a party that Jesus told this story. It's called a parable, which is a fancy word for story. Jesus told a story about a man who was having a party. And he invited all his guests. And then when the party was ready, none of the guests could come. How do you think he felt when that happened? I imagine he was sad. Yeah. So um, he didn't just stop there being sad. He decided to send his family out to invite people who were walking by on the street and invite them to this party because he had all the food and the candy and the balloons and the party favors. He was ready for a party. Jesus continues and tells the story that says that the party can't begin until everybody is at the table, till the table is filled. Jesus is really telling the story about his dad, who is God, and he's telling this story to say that God invites us to be talking with God, to be in a relationship with God, to be with God, and we sometimes say we're too busy. Um, kind of like the people who were invited to the party in this story. They said things like, I bought a cow, I can't come, I just got married, I can't come. And those excuses aren't great excuses. We need to come when we are invited to God's party. In the Bible, it has some um, sayings that Jesus says, like, come to me, all you who are weary and tired, and I will give you rest. Another time, Jesus says, let the children come to me, for to them belongs the kingdom of heaven. So Jesus and God invite us to God's party. And one of the best ways that we can say yes to the party that God and Jesus has invited us to is to pray. That's one way we keep the relationship going with God and with Jesus. That's one way we keep talking to God. So let us go to the party right now. Let us pray. Thank you, God, for the invitation to be with you and the party. Thank you, Jesus, for the invitation to come to you and have a rest. We love you, and we know that you love us. Amen. We turn to a few announcements that we want to share with you. Uh, first, Denny wants to share an announcement with you. 
October is designated as Pastor Appreciation Month. Pastor Holly, we would like to give you this as a token of our appreciation for the work you've done here with our congregation this year. Thank you. After Denny gave me this gift uh, for Clergy Appreciation Month, I thought of more words to say. I only said thank you before, but I just wanted to add to my thank you that it has been so great to hear your comments and appreciations in these last six months. It's meant a lot. And it's difficult when we are separated like this to do that kind of communication as well as we do when face to face. So I just wanna say thank you again, and to say that with a congregation like this, it is a joy to be a pastor. We continue with our announcements um, to tell you about a couple of upcoming Sundays. Sunday, October 25th is Confirmation Sunday for Kaylee and Ryan. They have gone through two years of confirmation education and uh, we're going to have them confirmed in worship, um, in worship in person on Sunday the 25th. We have their permission to record that event, so we will get that event online as soon as possible, maybe even as soon as as it is happening. So look for that. Also Sunday, November 1st is All Saints Sunday. Um, we've sent in the newsletter, but also want to just reiterate that if there is someone who has passed away in recent years that you want named and a candle lit for on Sunday, the 1st of November, please get that information to us by um, 8 a.m. Wednesday, October 28th. We continue to accept gifts for the benefit of the Refuge and the Lakes Center for Youth and Families. Thank you for your generosity thus far. We are looking towards matching what we were able to give them last year, which was $4,200. Remember that our YouTube Live that used to immediately follow this worship service has been moved to Wednesday evenings at 8 p.m. So Wednesday evenings at 8 p.m. is devotions as well as joys and concerns. Please check that out. We turn now to a time of prayer. Any prayers that are sent to Nancy will be included in this prayer time unless otherwise indicated. We have several prayer requests that have come on the prayer chain to Nancy this week. Prayers for Hank Hool, who is in Bethesda with COVID-19 but seems to be doing okay. He and his wife, Elaine, are friends of B and Myron. Prayers for Karen Kramer's sister, Sandra, and her husband, Dan, who both have COVID-19. Sandra is having congestion problems and a mild case of pneumonia. Prayers for Ed Kramer's brother, Don, who has stage four prostate cancer that has metastasized. Prayers for Don Metcalf, who had heart surgery on Thursday. Prayers for Cindy's mom, Molly, who is dealing with atrial fibrillation, and for Cindy, who had heart procedures this week. And finally, prayer requests for all those who are dealing with COVID-19, whether they are suffering from it or have a loved one who is suffering from it or if they are in leadership positions such as in the schools while we're dealing with this new normal. Let us pray. God of grace, God of glory, on your people pour your power. Thank you for the blessings that you pour upon us each day. Help us to have eyes to see and hearts to receive. Thank you for giving us hearts full of love that through being filled with your unconditional love, we can share that same grace with others. 
Help us to be curious about one another and slow to judge. Give us the grace to follow you in all we do and say. All this, O oh God, we pray in the name of the one who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. A certain man hosted a large dinner and invited many people. When it was time for the dinner to begin, he sent his servant to tell the invited guests, Come, the dinner is now ready. One by one, they all began to make excuses. The first one told him, I bought a farm and must go and see it. Please excuse me. Another said, I bought five teams of oxen and I'm going to check on them. Please excuse me. Another said, I just got married, so I can't come. When he returned, the servant reported these excuses to his master. The master of the house became angry and said to his servant, go quickly to the city streets, the busy ones and the side streets and bring the poor, crippled, blind and lame. The servant said, Master, your instructions have been followed, and there is still room. The master said to the servant, Go to the highways and back alleys and urge people to come in so that my house will be filled. Let us pray. Come, Holy Ghost, our souls inspire. Enlighten us with your celestial fire. For if you are with us, then nothing else matters. And if you are not with us, then nothing else matters. Be with us, we pray, in the name of your beloved. Amen. This is the second in a series of four sermons on talking about grace and politics, where we're learning how to prepare ourselves prepare ourselves for, and even seek out grace-filled political conversations. Last week, we talked about how we can personally prepare for such conversations by taking off our jerseys, finding our why, and putting politics in its place. 
This, that was all in self-improvement uh, activity. This week we're talking about reaching out to others and a couple of ways that we reach out to others is with grace and with curiosity. Grace is a concept that everybody seems to understand but nobody can quite define. My definition of grace is that it is unconditional love. The unconditional love that we get from God and are asked to share from that love to others. Author and pastor Frederick Beekner puts it this way. The grace of God means something like this. Here is your life. You might never have been, but the celebration would not have been complete without you. Grace is what is today's, what today's Bible story is all about. This parable in Luke is about a wealthy man hosting a large dinner and inviting everybody and their neighbors to come to the feast. Jesus prefaces this parable with these words. When you host a meal, don't invite your friends, your brothers and sisters, your relatives or rich neighbors. If you do, they will invite you in return and that will be your reward. Instead, when you give a banquet, invite the poor, crippled, lame and blind, and you will be blessed because they can't repay you. Then he tells this parable of the man hosting a dinner and invited guests sending back word uh, excuses like I bought a farm and I must go see it or I just got married and I can't come. The host then sends his servant into the city streets to gather in all those he can find to bring them to this feast. And the servant brings in many people off of the streets and highways and alleys and keeps bringing them in until the table is full. My Bible entitles this section of Luke as Lessons on Humility and Generosity. But I call it a story of grace, unmerited, unexpected grace that communicates that all are welcome at God's table. God's grace and welcome at God's table is what John Wesley, the founder of the Methodist movement, was likely thinking of when he preached. Though we cannot think alike, may we not love alike? May we not be of one heart, though we are not of one opinion? Without a doubt, we may. Herein, all the children of God may unite, notwithstanding these smaller differences. Grace recognizes that the person before you is made in the image of God, just as you are made in the image of God, and that they are as deeply loved by God as you are. You can extend grace to someone because you know that God loves all. Unfortunately, most political conversations don't have grace as their top priority. Even those of us who don't frequently engage in political conversations characterize the whole political arena as evil. How many of you, for example, have said of a political contest, I don't know who I'm going to vote for. To be honest, I think this election is a matter between choosing two evils. How many of you have done that? I know have, I have done that. And the problem with this is that it paints politics as an evil that we all must endure. And it is unfair to those who put themselves and their families through the rigors of running for an election, of putting themselves up for scrutiny and ridicule that comes from being a public figure. And by and large, the majority of those who are doing all of this hard work are doing it because they want to help the common good. They want to help the community work together better. Sarah Stewart Holland and Beth Silvers, author of the book, I Think You're Wrong, But I'm Listening, which is the basis in part for this sermon series, are two Christian women with differing perspectives who started back in 2015 a podcast called Pantsuit Politics. 
initially they had to be careful with one another because even though they knew each other in college, they were not close friends. But their partnership began when they both realized that each of them was passionate about politics and about starting grace-filled conversations with someone with whom they disagreed. Their podcast, begun in November of 2014, began by focusing on the debates on TV and social media and the primaries that were going on in anticipation of the 2016 election. As they watched, they saw debates that they deemed far too shallow. And they decided to go deeper by having their own debate on this podcast. They called it the Great Redhead Debate. They are both redheads. And took questions from their listeners for two weeks. They had as a moderator one of their more dedicated podcast listeners. And they took on this project with their hearts in the right place. What they soon discovered as the debate progressed is that they both dug in their heels for their political party and found themselves not extending grace to one another but starting to doubt the other person's intentions. They really got into it and as the debate went on they agreed that they agreed with each other less and less. They became more antagonistic and frustrated. They began interrupting each other and as they later wrote you could practically hear us roll our eyes at the other's answers to the debate questions. They had armored up, which is what a debate is designed to do. And they forgot to extend grace. I have noticed a similar problem with political posts on Facebook. The temptation is to present your side of any given disagreement as with a clever as clever a comment as possible. I regularly read comments by others where it is clear, even if they don't say as much, that what they are posting are not their words, but are copied from somebody else. Somebody else that spoke eloquently what they believed. I find those posts difficult to read because they don't reflect the person I know who is posting them. I personally know every person I am friends with on Facebook. So when someone posts this long and articulate rant that clearly does not come from their heart, I inwardly roll my eyes and scroll on past. When we don't use our own heartfelt words in political conversations, we stop extending grace to one another. Back in 2012, a friend of mine, John, took the time to look look through his own political, social, and religious lens about his thoughts on his thoughts about the Minnesota Marriage Amendment that we were voting on that fall. He didn't post his thoughts on Facebook, but he posted that he would be willing to share in a private message his thoughts if anyone should ask. And so I asked him to send me a private message and it was a long post weighing all things in his mind, political and social and religious. And as I read this long post, I read it with interest because I could hear the character and even the voice of John, my friend from college, and the thoughtful way that he was presenting it sounded just like him. When we post combative political words that are not ours. One of the first things to leave the conversation is grace. We quickly, quickly forget that those who we are talking to are beloved children of God, made in the image of God, loved so much that God sent Jesus to be God's love incarnate in the world. We are not enemies. We all want good for our families, for our country, for the world. Remembering that helps us turn towards others with grace. Just to be clear, offering grace does not mean that we abandon reason, accept radically harmful ideas, or agree that all opinions are valid. When we offer grace, 
We are not saying that all ideas are valuable, but that all people are valuable and loved without condition. When all sides of political disagreement start with grace, we have a common starting point that will help us air our opinions without demonizing the opinions of others. The second part of turning to political conversations with grace involves being curious. Being curious means being eager to learn, eager to find out. Being curious means asking questions like, what do you mean by that statement? Or what about that statement is most important to you? Questions about how people got to the conclusions that they now hold helps us understand their why in what they believe. When we ask questions with grace and compassion, we are able to dig more deeply into what is behind what people believe. I, for one, am fascinated with what is behind what people say. I love to learn about how people came to conclusions. Questions can open up the conversation to bring more nuance and clarity to the issues discussed. We are all guilty of making assumptions of one another. When we hear someone say, we really need to bring God back into the schools, we assume that they're Republican. When we hear somebody say, I was at the Women's March last week, we assume they're Democrats. Curious, curiosity is the antidote to assumptions. It takes off the labels we like to put on others. Last week we talked about taking off our partisan jerseys. Curiosity helps us not put partisan jerseys on others. Asking questions helps us take down the, the temperature of the argument or uh, conversation a notch and helps us to get to the why beyond the statement. When we offer grace to the other person and we are curious about where they are coming from and how they reach their conclusions, we enable one another to have productive and grace-filled conversations. John 13, verses 34 and 35 say, I give you a new commandment. Love each other as I have loved you. Just as I have loved you, so you must love each other. This is how everyone will know that you are my disciples when you love each other. Offering grace and showing curiosity are great ways to share grace-filled political conversations. Let us love one another as Christ has loved us.
go forth to have grace-filled political conversations with grace and curiosity. Amen.